All right, thank you everyone for coming. I'll go ahead and get started. I'll spend a few uh, minutes or so introducing the Everhart Lecture Series and myself, following which I'll call upon uh, Catherine's advisor, uh, who will introduce Catherine, uh, and uh, pending which the talk will commence. My name is Surya Narayan Hari. I am the uh, academic director of the GSC for the, uh, the year 2023-2024. And part of the GSC's programming includes organizing two Everhard lecture series, although this year we had such an outstanding application set that we chose three, uh, Catherine being the third Everhard lecture. In this lecture series, we aim to highlight both the outstanding research done here at Caltech, as well as aim to connect the research done here at Caltech to a wider public audience uh, of non-experts and experts in multiple subject fields. On that note, I'm really happy to have Catherine present. Having watched her once, I'm uh, really delighted to see what uh, she um, has put into this lecture, and, and I call upon her advisor to introduce her. Thank you for coming. All right, good evening. Um, my name is Greg Howland, and I'm a professor of astronomy um, and director of the Owens Valley Radio Observatory, which is the, in the, the picture here. And it is my uh, honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Catherine Plant, uh, uh, um, uh, as uh, the Everhart Lecture today. It's been a very busy week for Catherine. She uh, successfully, and uh, Emily defended her thesis on Tuesday, and, and of course today she's doing, she's giving this Everhart, Le Everhart Lecture. So uh, just a bit of background on Catherine. Uh, Catherine did her degree at the University of California, Santa Cruz, with a major in physics and a minor in math. Uh, she spent a year after that working in a research group um, uh, led by Matthew Bales, a radio astronomer in Australia. And even before she came to Caltech, I was hearing about this really great student uh, with a really unique skill set. Uh, and when she did come to Caltech, uh, I was actually chair of the graduate admissions committee that year. I was very excited when Catherine said yes and came to Caltech. And when she came to Caltech and we started chatting, I realized that Catherine was the right student for what was the most technically challenging PhD project that I'd ever uh, come up with, which was uh, accessing 1.4 terabits of data per second. That's 5.5 exabytes per year. I think that's probably a Guinness Book of Records uh, candidate for the most data any student's ever had to deal with. And access that data at nanosecond time resolution to look for the highest energy particles that, in the universe that, that strike the outer atmosphere of the Earth. We're talking 10 to the 5 times more energetic than anything produced, for example, in CERN. Uh, and, actually, you know, and the reason I knew Catherine was the right student was there was two primary reasons. Catherine came into the, her, the PhD program at Caltech. As well as being an, you know, an excellent PhD stu uh, uh, physics student, she actually had uh, an, ex an excellent skill set as a digital engineer, which is extremely rare for an incoming graduate student. It's rare for an outgoing graduate student, never mind an incoming graduate student. Uh, and I'd heard all about this from Matthew Bales, who's a very good friend of mine in Australia. And the second is because Catherine is, and this became clear very quickly, probably the most careful and methodical student I, I have ever worked with. She's technically gifted and she approaches all problems in a first principles, ground up fashion. Which, when you're building a, a big digital system that's really complex, is the right skill set. I don't have that skill set, by the way, but I could recognize that Catherine does have that skill set. Uh, and she came to Caltech, uh, she, she actually successfully um, uh, secured an NSF GRFP, which is a graduate research fellowship, so she was a, a research fellow um, funded by NSF while she was here, uh, and she successfully defended on Tuesday, so she was successful in building this huge system. Uh, it was it's an incredible piece of work, and I'm, I'm excited to say she's moving on uh, as a, uh, an NPP fellow, uh, as a postdoc to, to NASA JPL uh, for their prize fellowship, to continue her work in detecting thousands of these events per year with her new system. So without further ado, I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to Catherine. Thank you. Uh, so I will uh, present a talk on my thesis work, uh, designing a, er, and implementing uh, an upgrade to a radio telescope to make it a new telescope tackling the old mystery of the origins of the highest energy cosmic rays in the Milky Way. So cosmic rays are very high energy charged particles that are uh, typically uh, 
atomic nuclei with their electrons all removed. And they're, they're, we call them high energy because they're traveling very, very close to the speed of light. And now the Large Hadron Collider accelerates protons to 99. more nines than I'm going to try to list out loud percent of the speed of light. Uh, but cosmic rays are millions of times higher energy than this. And at, at that point, it's more useful to talk about energy than, than velocity. And so I'll give a brief reminder about energy. A moving object has kinetic energy. That's the, the energy in its motion. But objects also have energy even when they're not moving. And there's a bunch of forms of energy, but uh, that depend on the situation. If, it, if you have lifted it up somewhere, it has the energy that it could release when it falls. But uh, even when it's doing absolutely nothing, there's some energy in, in the matter itself. We call this rest energy, because even when it's at rest, it still has this energy. And there's a famous equation for how much energy this is. This is the, the E equals mc squared energy. It depends on the mass of the particle. And everything we interact with in everyday life, even things that are moving around pretty fast, the kinetic energy is a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the rest energy in the matter itself. But as something travels closer and closer to the speed of light, its total energy can actually be dominated by the fact that it's moving so fast. So coming back to the Large Hadron Collider, accelerating protons to 99 point, many nines percent of the speed of light, the rest energy of a proton is one giga electron volt. Uh, that's a unit that we like in particle physics. Uh, and the total energy is 7,000 giga electron volts. So its total energy is completely dominated by the fact that it's going that close to the speed of light. And now the highest energy cosmic rays that we've observed can have a single atomic nucleus with the total energy the same as the kinetic energy of a fast pitch baseball. And now I've just been talking about E equals mc squared and particle accelerators and a, a baseball is uh, well, it's, it would hurt if it hit you, but it's, it's not an explosion. So why is that so impressive that, that one atom has uh, that much energy? Well, it's impressive because a, <coughs> the difference in mass between a proton and a baseball is about the same as the difference between a baseball and the Earth. And so for one proton to have as much energy as a fast pitch baseball, that's, that's like the whole Earth is leaving the pitcher's hand uh, in, in proportion to, to how uh, fast the, the proton has to be going. And so the, those are the record setting highest energy cosmic rays. Uh, but I want to go back to the discovery of cosmic rays, because some things in astronomy uh, and, and physics get predicted, people sit down and think about what, what should be observed based on what we've already observed about the universe. Some things like gravitational waves and black holes were predicted long before they were observed and then people went looking for them. And other things get observed first and then they've got to be explained. And cosmic rays have always been in, in this category. They were not, not expected until, until they were found. And, uh, but their story goes back to the origins of, of particle physics as, as a field. Uh, people in the late 1800s and early 1900s had uh, devices called electroscopes that could detect when ionizing radiation, that is something that it has enough energy to strip the electrons away from the uh, atoms in air. Uh, they detected this radiation with electroscopes because uh, there's a charged uh, there's a, a piece of metal with a charge placed on it and two foil leaves, and the, the charge repels itself, and so the leaves separate out, and the charge can't conduct away, can't conduct to ground, unless something comes through and ionizes the air, so the air itself starts conducting. So they had, they had these simple devices for checking for high-energy radiation, 
and they noticed, and they were using them to study radioactivity. Uh, radioactive materials had relatively recently been discovered at that time. Uh, but they noticed that even when they put away all the radioactive samples, the electroscopes kept discharging. And they tried packing lead around it so nothing could, because uh, when, you, when you go to the dentist, you wear a lead uh, vest to protect the rest of your body from that x-ray radiation. Well, they packed lead around the electroscopes and it still discharged. That meant whatever it was was very energetic. It was making it through the lead. Uh, then they thought maybe it's coming from the ground. Maybe the, there's the background of, of radioactive materials in the earth. So they took it up a tall building and it still discharged. So they took it up a taller building, which fortunately had just been built around that time. Uh, and then finally, uh, Victor Hest took these up in a hot air balloon and he noticed that at some point above the Earth's surface, the radiation that these electroscopes were measuring began to increase with height. There was more and more of it as you got higher in the atmosphere. And so he realized this stuff was coming from outer space and he called it cosmic rays. And so ever since then, the big questions about cosmic rays have been where do we get them from? And parts of this puzzle have been answered, but at the highest energies, it hasn't been answered. And along the way, cosmic rays have uh, help, helped propel early particle physics. Uh, before uh, accelerators like the LHC and, and earlier versions of accelerators were built, cosmic rays were the only source of high energy particles to uh, study particle collisions with. Uh, some examples of discoveries include the, the discovery of antimatter right here at Caltech in the 1930s was uh, discovered, and this is a photographic plate of the, the track of the uh, positron, uh, that was discovered using cosmic rays. And the cosmic rays that we observe on the surface of the Earth are the products of collisions of a, a primary cosmic ray with the atmosphere. Some of these products, like electrons and positrons, as well as muons and some other things, make it all the way to the ground. But there's this uh, cascade, like falling dominoes, of one particle running into another, so that the uh, particles that we observe on the ground are actually quite different from the original cosmic ray at the top of the atmosphere. So the, the biggest questions are, where do the highest energy cosmic rays come from? And <laughs> And then what is the fastest particle that our Milky Way galaxy can accelerate? So I, I promise I won't show too many plots in this talk, but this is one plot that I think is especially exciting, and it's the uh, overall energy spectrum of cosmic rays. So this axis shows the uh, flux, the, the number of cosmic rays landing in a region of a given size from a given direction in a given amount of time. And uh, this axis is the energy of the cosmic ray. So the, the higher the cosmic ray energy, the more rare it is. And what's remarkable is that for, <coughs> this is a, a logarithmic axis, and so for 10 orders of magnitude in energy, the uh, flux of cosmic rays follows this steady decrease, even though uh, it, there isn't one single cosmic ray object that can explain all of this, but they all fit on this, on this plot. Uh, and at the <coughs> lower energies, uh, where this arrow is pointing, there's one cosmic ray per square meter every second. Then at, at energies at this, at this arrow, there's one cosmic ray per square meter per day. And then at the highest energies, you might only get one cosmic ray per square kilometer every year. So the higher the energy, the bigger you need your detector to be to study these particles. Uh, and this arrow is pointing out the maximum energy that the Large Hadron Collider can study. So even, even today at the uh, highest energies of studying particles, we rely on cosmic rays uh, because we can't do this in a lab on the ground. But so now we've People have been wondering about cosmic rays for more than 100 years at this point. Uh, why are they so hard to pinpoint? Why don't you just catch one, see which direction it came from, and, and then point all the other telescopes there and see, see what's out there? And uh, 
you can't do that, or at least you can't usefully do it, because cosmic rays are charged, and so they turn when they move through magnetic fields. Charged particles experience a force in a magnetic field that's at right angles to the direction they're going, and so they're con they travel this windy path through the, gala the galaxy's magnetic fields. Whereas other particles that we use in astronomy, like photons, travel in straight lines. Uh, this cartoon is uh, showing a, a source of high energy particles here, such as a black, the gas around a black hole, perhaps. Uh, and the photons travel in straight lines. Some of them get blocked by other stuff along the way. The neutrinos also travel in straight lines, and they don't get blocked very much. So that's a great thing about neutrinos. The hard thing about neutrinos is, since they don't run into stuff, they also go right through most detectors. And it, that's a whole, whole other complicated story to talk about, trying to detect uh, neutrinos and do astronomy with them. And the cosmic rays make it to Earth, but they take a roundabout way. And so the direction they are coming from when they get here isn't the direction they started out. Uh, supernova remnants are now pretty sure to be the source of most galactic cosmic rays up to, uh, up, up to about 10 to the 15 PeV energies. And uh, this, uh, this idea works because they, they have the right energy, the uh, supernova remnants have the right conditions of magnetic fields and shock waves for the acceleration uh, process to take place, and uh, the, the total number of supernova remnants and the amount of energy it could be putting into cosmic rays matches up really nicely with the amount of cosmic rays at, at that lower energy range that are observed. Uh, and the supernova, supernova remnants themselves, if you look at them with gamma ray telescopes, they're very bright in gamma rays, and the gamma rays should go along with cosmic rays. So it's uh, very confident that, co that supernova remnants produce the lower energy cosmic rays, but it, uh, above a certain energy, it's difficult to make a theoretical model that lets a supernova remnant produce the highest energy cosmic rays. Uh, and so at the, at the very highest energies, uh, it's one of the favorite hypotheses for where cosmic rays might come from are the supermassive black holes at the center of other galaxies. And now the cosmic rays don't come out of the black holes, nothing comes out of the black holes, but as gas is falling into the black holes, it gets very hot, it gets moving very fast, and uh, some of it doesn't fall right in and gets launched out in, in jets instead, and these jets might have the right conditions for producing uh, perhaps the highest energy cosmic rays. Uh, but there's a a bit of a gap between the cosmic rays that probably come from distant galaxies and the cosmic rays that could come from supernova remnants right here in our own galaxies, in our own galaxy. I. Here are just a few of the, the many ideas for I, where these could be coming from in, in our galaxy. We, so we, we probably need something that isn't a supernova remnant to produce the cosmic rays right at the limits of what the Milky Way can accelerate. And one possibility is something that involves, super, that involves neutron stars. This is uh, the same supernova remnant that I showed a picture of earlier, but with an X-ray picture overlaid on top of it. And it's actually been turned into a movie where the, the rate of the frames is, is something on the order of months. So this has really been... Uh, sped up, but the center of this particular supernova remnant has a, a neutron star that is very highly magnetized and has a lot of high energy gas around it, and it's possible that something like this can produce uh, fairly high energy cosmic rays. Uh, an interesting uh, clue towards having pulsars like this produce cosmic rays, and, and that pulsar I showed on the previous page is a particularly special one because of the strong magnetic field and the material it has around it. Uh, gamma ray telescopes see a lot of gamma rays from the direction of supernova remnants and, and some pulsars. So uh, it's as, as I mentioned earlier, gamma rays can go along with cosmic rays and some of the uh, theories for how they, they propagate. So this makes uh, pulsars an interesting place to look. 
Uh, another idea, which again still involves a neutron star, uh, but in a somewhat different way, is something called an, an X-ray binary, which is an a ordinary star that is overflowing onto a neutron star or a black hole. So it's uh, the outer layers of gas from the star are flowing into the black hole or flowing onto the neutron star. And because it's so, uh, so dense uh, and the gravitational field is so strong, it gets very hot and can also launch jets. It's like a miniature version of the uh, supermassive black holes at the centers of distant galaxies. And then another idea is maybe instead of looking for something very uh, hot and intense magnetic fields and compact, maybe the cosmic rays are accelerated very slowly over extremely large distances in very weak magnetic fields. And so galactic winds are an interesting place to look as well. And the, the galactic wind is the uh, uh, moderately high energy gas that is flowing out of a galaxy and interacting with the, the intergalactic medium. And there can be shock waves there that even though the magnetic fields are much weaker, there are huge spaces for these particles to more slowly accelerate over. So that's another interesting possibility. This is not a photo of the Milky Way's galactic wind. This is a photo of a, another galaxy that has a, a much stronger outflow than, than what the Milky Way has. But it's easier to show a picture of this than to show a picture of a wind that we are sitting inside. And uh, to sum up this tour of, of the different places that cosmic rays might come from, uh, a good way to compare cosmic ray accelerators is to compare their size and their magnetic field, because the cosmic rays have to be contained within the accelerator region. And the magnetic field doesn't do the acceleration, but it does the uh, confining, because it is constantly making the particle turn around, and so it can't escape very easily. And so if you have a weak field, the particle will, will turn in a bigger circle. And if that weak field goes on for a very long ways, it will still contain the particle. If you have a, a very small source, but it has a very strong magnetic field, the particles will go in very tight circles, and the, the compact source can contain it. And so on this axis, the size of different objects. And on this axis, their magnetic field strength. And these are both log axes. And so you can compare each. Each class of object occupies some range of this parameter space. And specific particles, like a, a proton with 10 to the 15 electron volts energy, a proton with 1,000 times more energy than that, these particles uh, can trace out uh, lines of, of constant uh, turning radius that would indicate where, whether or not the accelerator could contain them. And so in this plot, you can compare neutron stars white with strong magnetic fields and small sizes, white dwarfs, gamma ray bursts, active galactic nuclei, uh, jets from black holes and other galaxies. And uh, this plot sums up that all these, these objects that I've been talking about in the last few slides are interesting uh, for the, the highest energy and the kind of transition energy of uh, cosmic rays. So now I, I want to move towards how, how we study cosmic rays from the ground and the instrument that I have worked on. I mentioned earlier cosmic rays collide with the atmosphere and the original particle doesn't make it to the ground. Uh, but several different kinds of particles do. And so if you have a, a primary cosmic ray coming in from the, the top and making this cascade of high energy particles, uh, there is uh, several, several different ways that photons can come out of this. Uh, something called Cherenkov radiation, which is the light equivalent of a sonic boom. And now nothing goes faster than light in a vacuum, but air and other materials with an index of refraction slow light down. So you could have something go faster than the speed of light in air, uh, and Cherenkov radiation can be thought of as somewhat analogous to the sonic boom that happens when something breaks the sound barrier. Uh, there is some fluorescence where the air molecules that are just uh, happening to be bystanders to all of this get uh, their electrons boosted to higher energies that uh, then release uh, light as they settle back down. 
eye. So uh, special telescopes can look for very fast flashes of light that go with cosmic rays. The disadvantage of that is that you need a very clear night to do the observing. Uh, there are some particles that make it to the ground, electrons and positrons, and also muons and anti-muons. Uh, and then what I'm going to focus on is the radio emission that makes it to the ground, because charged particles that are accelerating radiate, and there's a lot of charged particles that are accelerating in, in this uh, shower of, of particle collisions. And so uh, some, a big part of, an important part of the radiation is, is in radio waves. The nice thing about radio antennas is they, they work in any weather uh, within, within reason. <laughs> there are, <laughs> are weathers that can make a radio antenna not work, but, but pretty much radio antennas work uh, in any weather, and they're a lot cheaper than a lot of these other detection techniques. And uh, with the radio antennas, <coughs> you're looking at the uh, dense part of the shower, which has uh, the most information about the original particle. So overall, the way, uh, the way you can uh, build an experiment to uh, reconstruct information about the population of original particles, where you're not going to be so interested in the arrival directions necessarily, but the uh, composition of the particles, whether they're heavy elements or light elements, gives clues about shifts in source classes. And so to study the composition, you you event, you'll eventually want, you'll want a composition estimate for uh, a large sample of cosmic rays. You want to know, are they mostly heavy elements or are they mostly light el elements? And since you can't uh, make exact isotope measurements if all you're doing is, is collecting what makes it to the ground, if, if at, at lower energies there are satellites that can measure cosmic rays to the exact isotope, but they have to be lower energy in order to uh, catch one with a collector area that you can actually launch into space. So for the rare cosmic rays at very high energies that you have to study from the ground, uh, you can estimate the composition from a couple things that you can measure for the air shower, which is the, the depth that it goes in the atmosphere and the total energy of the shower. Uh, and, but to get to here, you have to be able to uh, save data for very, very fast uh, flashes of light, and then process it through data quality cuts to be able to estimate these key parameters of the, the shower itself. And I, for my thesis, I built this capability for the Owens Valley Radio Observatory Long Wavelength Array. And this is stuff I've started working on, and this is stuff that are my goals for my, my postdoc position in the fall. The Owens Valley Radio Observatory Long Wavelength Array is uh, at an observatory that Caltech operates a couple hundred miles north of here in the Eastern Sierra. And it's an array of dipole radio antennas that uh, works from uh, about 50 megahertz below the FM radio band up to the FM radio band. It's uh, 352 of those dipole antennas, and that's the result of a big upgrade that has happened over the last four years. Uh, these are miscellaneous photos from, from upgrading the array. And uh, in order to design into this upgrade a capability to detect cosmic rays, I need to talk a little bit more about uh, what the radio emission from cosmic rays is like. Uh, so it's, it's actually beamed into uh, sort of a cone of light, almost like a flashlight beam, where it, doesn't, it won't light up every antenna. It will only be detected by uh, a certain subset of them, depending on where the cosmic ray is, is coming from. And it's a very, very fast, maybe 10 nanosecond flash of radio waves. So th this plot is going to show a movie of a cosmic ray that a previous grad, grad student detected right before the upgrade to the array to demonstrate that it was going to be worth putting a cosmic ray detector as a, a mainstream part of the telescope. Uh, so in this plot, uh, 
the axes are coordinates, north, south, and east, west, and every spot is at the position of an antenna in the core part of the LWA. And the color and also the spot size correspond to the power at the antenna. So I'm going to run the video, and of course it's been uh, sl slowed down by a huge factor so that we can see it, but you see the cosmic ray sw sweep across the array. Uh, and uh, for the next main part of the talk, I'm going to be talking about what it takes to find these fast flashes of radio emission. Uh, first, it helps that all of the antennas uh, send their signals, their analog signals, back to one central processing location where devices called analog to digital converters measure the voltage on a wire for every antenna uh, almost 200 million times a second uh, to make a uh, time series of voltages, voltages over time, which is what we can search for fast flashes of emission. And bringing all 352 antennas back to one central place involves plugging in a lot of cables. So this is a, a, a time series of voltage that I was uh, mentioning on the previous slide. There's a spike in it. That spike, in this case, turns out not to be a cosmic ray, but this is the, the kind of fast flash that we would want to detect. Uh, but the whole array produces a terabit per second of data. And so we're only going to save the interesting data. We don't want to save all of it. We can't actually stuff it all on the computers fast enough. So I, I've built a system that will save snapshots of data when something interesting, like a quick flash like that, happens. And now a little bit about all of the other things that make quick flashes of radio emission. So uh, televisions or television broadcasts have uh, radio emission in the band that we're sensitive to. Uh, Oh, also, I mentioned FM radio earlier. Other radio bands that uh, maybe you know, uh, ham radio operators or uh, people who use the, the CB band, but uh, there's a lot of uh, radio communications that are transmitted in our band. But most of these aren't fast flashes. So there's some kind of background, but they, they don't look like a cosmic ray. Uh, and then there are airplanes, which make some fast flashes of their own, and also make weird flashes by uh, reflecting radio waves off of them. Uh, and then a big thing that makes very fast flashes of radio emission is faulty power lines. Uh, when there's a fault in a power line and something is sparking, uh, just, just like a spark plug in a car, which also makes radio emission, uh, sparks in faulty power lines make very fast flashes of radio emission, which uh, can, can be a big background. And so it's kind of like searching for a needle in a haystack, where there's a, thousands of flashes of radio emission every second, and I'm looking for about five cosmic rays per day. The way to address this is to use uh, special digital signal processing equipment called field programmable gate arrays. Uh, and field programmable gate arrays are a bit like a computer in that they do, they do math, they do logic operations. But when you write code for a computer and then compile it, the compiler finds the best way to do your computation on the uh, hardware equipment that you have. And a field programmable gate array is a network of logic gates, kind of like Legos, that can be re reconnected to build something different just for your program. And so you can make very fast uh, computations, and you can make devices that handle a very uh, large data rate, because they're, these devices are very good at handling a lot of input and output data. You can uh, com sort of compartmentalize it into streams of parallel processing. Uh, and so these boards process the raw output of the analog to digital converters. And since I mentioned earlier, we can't stuff all of the data into computers to start looking for the cosmic rays, the first step of the cosmic ray detection has to happen on these boards. Uh, and 
this map shows the positions of the LWA antennas, and they're color-coded by which signal processing FPGA processes their data. Uh, we grouped this in the way that would be best for cosmic ray detection, because as I mentioned earlier, cosmic rays only illuminate a confined part of the array. And so if a cosmic ray is shining on the core of the array, it won't be illuminating the distant antennas. So the search for cosmic ray uh, flashes of impulsive radio emission happens within the FPGAs, and it uses the distant antennas to veto RFI. Because if something lights up here and also lights up there, it's not a cosmic ray. Or it, there, there are special situations where it could be a, a cosmic ray out of the energy range that I'm looking for. But I, and I think I'll go pretty quickly through this, but I wanted to give a quick overview of, of what the FPGA is doing to search for the cosmic rays. Uh, first, it calculates uh, an offset in time for how long it took the uh, signal to get from the antenna to the analog to digital converter, because this is an array that stretches over kilometers. And so, uh, and so it's not, uh, not aligned in time once it gets back to the signal processing shelter. Then it uh, does some filtering and squaring and smoothing so that something that goes in looking like that would, would then look like a, a pulse. And then there's a threshold detector that whenever a pulse goes above a threshold, it outputs a uh, signal that is a yes or no. And then to compare different antennas, it has to be extended over the light travel time between those antennas, so that yes or no waits to hear from the other antennas nearby. And then I sum over all the antennas to count how many had an event that they saw within the right amount of time. And in that case, there is a signal to read out all of the data, except we want to reject some of the interference. So there's kind of parallel logic that is doing this with the distant antennas and rejecting interference. It can cancel the trigger. And then meanwhile, the raw data is being saved for 20 microseconds. And when there's a trigger signal, instead of saving new data to that place, the last 20 microseconds of data are sent to computers. Uh, this is a quick overview of the network that it took to be able to save data from, from every antenna all at once. Uh, ultimately, I want it to all get to a computer, which I've marked as a CPU. And there are 11 FPGAs. They get some uh, settings and monitoring information over a regular Ethernet network. And then they send their data on a very fast Ethernet network. But they also have to talk to each other, because when one FPGA has some antennas detect a signal, I want to get data from all of them. And Ethernet was too slow to do this. So they're actually wired together with a special direct uh, one-bit communication on a wire that sends a very fast signal to all of them. Uh, this was a photo of some of the, the, the work of being able to wire them together. It, it turned out we needed a special uh, extra circuit board, and it had to fit in a very tight place, so I had to 3D print it to see if it would fit before, uh, before we ordered a bunch of them. Uh, and a few other adventures involved uh, putting uh, fiber optic equipment in an oven to see if it would work at all the temperatures that happen. Uh, and it's a, this is both a freezer and an oven. And we had to cycle it through all, all the temperatures that the uh, high desert experiences. Uh, I found out that uh, bushes growing on the antennas change their electrical properties. Uh, so that, that was an interesting side adventure. And this particular species is worse. <laughs> uh, and yeah, this upgrade was a, about a four-year process. Part of it was COVID. And uh, uh, just this year, it's, it's finishing. And we're ready to start searching for cosmic rays. This is a plot of uh, one of the first whole nights of observing with uh, the trigger rates over time monitored for the, the whole night, the, the trigger rate and the veto rate. Uh, and I just wanted to show that now I'm, I'm reading out uh, fast transient flashes of radio emission. So far, uh, 
their RFI that I'm working on filtering to get down to the, the cosmic ray in the middle of the RFI. Uh, but this is something that illuminated the core and illuminated it in a uh, tight pattern of emission, which is exciting because that's similar to a cosmic ray. But its waveform looks like this, which is not a cosmic ray. It's very repetitive. And then this was a nice, clean, fast flash, which was exciting because that's similar to a cosmic ray. But it doesn't really light up a confined pattern of antennas. Uh, so these are, are two examples of the, the stuff that I'm searching through just to show that now the search has begun. Uh, and so in, in conclusion, this uh, detector has been uh, a work in progress for several years now, and it's, it's finally getting to start searching for the highest energy particles in the Milky Way. And now I wanted to do some acknowledgments, which in, in a lot of departments, it's traditional at the end of your defense to give uh, longer acknowledgments than you normally would at a talk. And in astronomy, we do closed door defenses. And so there's a lot of people that I didn't get to thank. Uh, and so I just thought I would thank them now. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge the, the Big Pine Paiute tribe. Ovro, the Owens Valley Radio Observatory, is in a special place in the Eastern Sierra. And uh, this place has traditional owners who uh, have ap approved of the LWA being built and even oversaw all the miles of trenches that were dug to make sure that it was uh, built in respectful places. And so I'm uh, very lucky and thankful to be able to work on an array in this special place. Uh, I want to thank my advisors, Greg Hallinan and Andres Romero-Wolf. They are both uh, just wonderfully enthusiastic, uh, fun people to work with. And I, uh, I am most thankful that they always believed I could do this project even when I wasn't so sure. Uh, I w want to thank everyone at OVRO uh, who made the observatory a very welcoming, fun place to work and who I, I learned so much from and who this, this project wouldn't be possible without. Uh, yeah, ev everyone from people who I worked closely with over the last few years to, uh, to someone who gave me a welding lesson one time. And ev yeah, every, every trip to Obro was special. I, there's a lot of collaborators that, that I should thank, and I only had a chance to put a few people on a few names on the slide, but I especially want to thank Jack Hickish for teaching me everything that I know about FPGAs and uh, Washington Car Carvalho for uh, collaboration on, on figuring out what kinds of cosmic rays we can observe with the Ovro LWA. Uh, Noemi Globus for a side project that I didn't get to discuss. Uh, and everyone who keeps Cahill going, uh, Gita and Stephanie and Althea, uh, Patrick Shopbell for uh, lots of computing uh, help. I want to acknowledge the, the NSF GRFP that funded my project. Uh, and then I really want to thank my friends and family and uh, fellow grad students at Caltech. Uh, starting with, with family, uh, unfortunately, the photo I could find with the most of us in one picture, everybody's watching soccer. <laughs> uh, and so I tried to add in a, a few other pictures to balance it out. But uh, I also discovered in making these slides that I don't take a lot of pictures. And so there's people missing who should definitely be on here. Uh, particularly, I want to thank my grandparents for their endless curiosity that really, I think, has encouraged several of us in my family to be scientists because yeah, they always, always are curious about what we're doing and are always asking questions about things. Uh, I think the best thing about being a grad student at Caltech is all the, all my fellow grad students that I get to learn from. I, I'm just amazed to get to be here with all of these people, and I, I especially want to thank the. Uh, housemates who I can't believe I couldn't find photos of all of our pandemic cooking uh, that we did. And uh, also every, everyone that I have ever roped into running some long distance with me. Uh, I, there's just a few photos here, but I also need to add a photo of the uh, Ragnar Relay team where we ran overnight in uh, 
uh, Utah and Tahoe and especially uh, see two people in the audience who were absolute heroes for or we had somebody drop on the team and I, I called them and said, do you want to go to Utah and run uh, for 24 hours, but you only have to run uh, about once every eight hours. And, and he said, sure. <laughs> and I said, we're leaving tomorrow. And he's like, sure, I'll, I'll go do it. And he even found somebody else who would do it. Uh, and, and then I, I especially want to thank uh, Phil for just being incredibly supportive and just yeah, constantly supporting me getting to the end of this PhD. Uh, things are absolutely out of order. I have my first year cohort, which I meant to put it towards the beginning, uh, but yeah, I had a wonderful cohort of, of first year grad students, and there we are uh, unpacking or packing our office. <laughs> and yeah, thank you. Thank you, Catherine, Dr. Plant. That was really great. Uh, I'm going to now moderate the question and answer session, uh, and I'm happy to, to take any questions. I, I also have a couple of questions of my own, and I'm happy to pull them off or if, if anybody else wants to, or I can also get us started. Why don't I do that? Um, so I have a quick question about, um, in your, one of your early slides, you mentioned that some of the rays you detected uh, were once one per kilometer per year or something. And, and varying with that. I'm curious how you quantify rays. What does it mean to be, to have, to measure one ray? Uh, okay, so the, the one per kilometer squared per year takes an even larger instrument than, than what we have. Uh, so this would be when you're in the energy range, this is probably coming, potentially coming from uh, active galaxies outside of the Milky Way. Uh, and the way this is counted is that one shower of particles comes from one primary cosmic ray. And you can estimate what its energy was from the energy in the particles that make it to the ground. The more, the more energy in the cosmic ray, the more energy in the shower. So you measure the energy in the shower, and then you count the number of cosmic rays uh, by counting the number of showers. The showers are very rare at that energy range, and so there's no, even though there are a lot of particles in one shower, there's no blurring between one cosmic ray to the next because you have to wait a very long time to see another one. I'm, I have more questions, but I'll hold off if there's anybody in the audience who has any questions. I'll, I'll come and hand the mic and, and um, to make sure that this is recorded, to the, make sure the questions are recorded. Uh, Thanks. Thanks for the really nice talk. Um, so I'm wondering, like, uh, when you detect these microwaves, how strong is the signal? Do you need to do any kind of careful or special amplification? Or like, if I had an antenna, could I just plug it into an oscilloscope and, and see a signal? Uh, so actually, you don't need a lot of amplification. It's pretty bright. Uh, and the eye. Uh, what limits the faintest signals we could look for is actually the uh, background radio light from the galaxy. The, the Milky Way is very bright at these wavelengths. And so uh, the system does have amplifiers, uh, and, but the limiting factor is that the cosmic ray has to be brighter than the galaxy. OK. Thank you. So you uh, mentioned something about isotopic analysis, and I, I understand that it's not possible at all the energies, but I was just curious, what kind of elements make up cosmic rays? Ah, so at the, at the low energies where we can measure exact isotopes, uh, it's uh, all of the elements that we observe in the sun or on Earth, and then there are actually some that are only from cosmic rays because there are some uh, nuclei that aren't energetically favorable in fusion in stars to make, and also aren't uh, left over from the, the Big Bang. And so these nuclei only exist when they've had a particular kind of collision that, that cosmic rays can have in the ISM, uh, or, or a cosmic ray has collided with a atom and the output of that collision is a different isotope. So when you can look at things at the isotope level, there are those 
interesting things to look for. But, the, but those elements are, are found on Earth as well. They just, even the ones on Earth came from cosmic rays originally. Uh, and then at the highest energies, you can't know the mass of an individual cosmic ray, but if you have a large enough sample, you can make statistical uh, statements about, on average, was it more light elements or heavy elements. Cool. There are other questions in the audience? How do you get from the data you collect, the, uh, those signals, to knowing the, the isotope, or the, the, at least the mass of the cosmic ray? Uh, that's from the height, from the, the height in the atmosphere where the air shower reaches its uh, uh, most intense number of output particles. And you can measure that by uh, the way that we'll do it with, with OVRO is you simulate a lot of air showers and calculate what the radio emission should be. And then you check which one of those simulations looks like what you measured. And then that gives you an estimate of what the features of the shower uh, should have been. And then even with that, you don't, uh, we're not comparing things at the isotope level. It would be more, is this more like a proton or an iron? Uh, thank you. If there are no more questions, I'll ask one more question before we conclude. Uh, my last question is, are there any theoretical models for uh, cosmic ray production process uh, estimation, or is there any theoretical framework by which you can estimate the origin of a cosmic ray? Uh, yeah, so they, have, they start out as ordinary particles. They have to get accelerated uh, to very close to the speed of light, and there's a lot of theoretical models for how that might happen, but the favorite ones in, uh, involve shock waves in a, in a diffuse dilute gas in some level of magnetic field. And the magnetic field, uh, so the, the particles cross the shock wave, and it's almost like surfing, where you get a little bit of a boost from the wave. But then what the magnetic field does is it takes the cosmic ray and turns it around and makes it go back through the shock again. And so maybe it only gets a little boost every time, but after enough uh, lapse through the shock wave, it can reach very high energies. Uh, and, th and that's not the only acceleration model, but that is something that uh, theoretically appears to work in a lot of different kinds of astrophysical contexts. 